Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our webinar on uh, which is an outcome from the SUSCAT project, which I'm sure Gillian and Hannah will talk about presently. Um, we've got about 60 of you have joined us, so we'll get started now as we've only got an hour and we've got quite a lot that we want to get through this evening. Um, and so I'm just really, really pleased that so many people have obviously got an interest in the impact of pasture fed diets and systems on dairy and beef. So uh, we're absolutely delighted to have Hannah and Gillian joining us from University of Newcastle um, and both of whom have been involved in this project. So um, please do, we are recording the session this evening. Um, if I can ask that you use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen um, if you've got questions and what we'll be doing is picking those up. Um, I'll be monitoring that, picking those up for our panel to answer uh, after they've presented. And if there is anything that you're, you're wanting clarification on, we can obviously also pick that up out of the chat. Um, but if you've got very specific questions, please do use the Q&A. So um, I'm going to hand over to Gillian now. Gillian, if you'd like to do a quick brief intro of yourself, that would be great. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing what you both have to say this evening. Am I ready to share my screen? Yes, please. Right. Okay. I, I'm impressed with the list of people that have joined and the numbers. It's fascinating to think so many people are interested in, in our work. Um, I've been working at Newcastle University for over 20 years. Um, and my research is looking at the impact that how we manage our animals has on food quality linked to, to our health. Before that, I worked as a, an advisor consultant with ADAS. Um, helping farmers to move onto grass, primarily um, for cost, but subsequently I realised there's a lot more to it than that. As Nikki said, all our uh, work we're going to talk about tonight came from the SUSCAT project, and I'll say a bit about that. But we've also had funding from um, the EU DEFRA and the Sheepdog Trust that makes all our, our work possible. You might think, well, what's SUSCAT? It is a project under the Susan Aronet. Susan is a, a cute name that is the Sustainable Animal Production Systems in Europe and the Aronet is European Research Area Network. Um, our project ran for three years oops, and it finished just at the end of 2020. And we were evaluating a move to high forage and pasture diets for dairy and beef cattle. We're looking at productivity, health, welfare and economic performance um, and various other things and included in that is the consumer's appreciation of grass fed. The main hypothesis that we had when we wrote this, thinking back probably four, maybe five years ago, was that a transition to high forage or non-food diets would improve product quality, health, welfare um, and also be more acceptable to the consumers. We actually identified quite a few of tick boxes there that we've, we've ticked um, and hopefully we'll explore some of the findings in this webinar and another one in, in a couple of weeks time. We're from Newcastle University, we were one of the partners but we had partners in six different countries in seven different institutes. It was coordinated by Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy and Research. We also had two partners in Sweden, um, one in Kiel University in northern Germany, one in Poland and one in Italy um, and we all worked together for, for different aspects. Each partner chose interventions or changes that were relevant for their, their country and their circumstances. Um, and I'll just briefly run through um, what we did. In Sweden, they looked at using beef cross semen for dairy herds and they, they had a sort of semi-intensive finishing of bulls and steers. Um, in Italy, they looked at alternatives to maize silage as that were a bit more sustainable, both for beef production and dairy production. 
Here in UK, we worked with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association and we were looking at um, forage only diets, both for beef and dairy cattle. And I'll, we'll hear a lot about that in a minute. Um, in Norway, they looked at historic records of um, milk production over three years. They ranked them according to um, concentrate use and then looked at economics. And that one will be covered in a, in a few weeks time. Um, in the, the next webinar. In Poland, they looked at renovating permanent pasture, which is maybe not along the ethos of the um, mob grazing and, and things that we're doing because they actually destroyed some very diverse pastures and put ryegrass in. And <laughs> so we haven't included that, but they, they, managed, they were pushing for higher um, milk output. And in Germany, we had some fascinating work where they were looking at simple and diverse wards um, and looking at milk production and methane output. And again, that's something that we'll talk about next time round. We also thought about farmers and consumers attitude to grass fed. What are the barriers? Why do the farmers not adopt grass fed? And why do the consumers or why might the consumers not know about it? We have the partners in Sweden and Norway were assessing economic and environmental impact of all our different innovations. And then we brought everything together and talked about it, hopefully. Um, and I would highly recommend, not that I'm biased, but I would recommend going to our website where our dissemination is. And that link should be live in the recorded um, output. And we produced a handbook on, on sustainable cattle systems and a whole series of technical notes, two page notes summarising our findings. And there's a couple of, of um, reports here on the economy, our a synthesis, which is a summary of our project. And um, this is the Norwegian study on, on the, the um, milk output, which we'll hear next time round. So, a plug for our website have a look and explore and see what's there my stopped moving oh yes so what are we going to talk about within these these webinars and i've highlighted there that the um we're talking on on the uk work today and we're also going to include norway and germany in the work at the next webinar so just to talk a bit more about what we did at Newcastle, we were looking at milk and meat quality from 100% forage feeding. Hannah did a lot of the dairy work where she looked at milk from pasture fed cows compared to organic and conventional milk. And she was identifying the best cows to suit low input systems. That was a data set that was left over from a, a previous project. And on the beef side, we looked at the um, fat composition of sirloin steaks that we bought seems a, a long time ago now in this time two years ago and we um, bought conventional and organic in the supermarkets PFLA from registered or certified farms and we also had some from conservation grazing farms um, we looked at consumer um, attitude to pasture fed and we also looked at milk quality from the study in Germany, where we were, try we're trying to link that up to um, methane output. Since the fatty acid profile in the milk and the methane depend on what's going on in the rumen and the, the activity of the microbiome, um, we're hoping that we would be able to predict one from the other. Um, it's a bit challenging measuring methane, um, but can we use milk composition to, to um, give us a shortcut to methane emissions? Before I start talking about our results or hand over to Hannah to talk about hers, I want to maybe put it into context and think about why are we bothered about the fat composition in our diet? And maybe I should put an apology in this time. I've spoken about this quite a few times and some of you may have heard 
heard my views on things. So apologies if this is a repeat, but um, I'm hopefully reinforcing the message. The, the fat in the milk and meat that we consume are made up of a whole range of individual fatty acids. And in milk, they reckon there's about 400 or in excess of 400 different fatty acids that go in to make up the milk fat. Before I start talk, or we start talking about the composition of the, the fat, say a bit about the structure. Fatty acids are chains of carbon atoms, anything from four, the most simple um, butyric acid, up to 24 carbons. Most of them are even numbers, four, six, eight, but there are minor fatty acids that are odd chain, five, um, seven, and so. We talk about them with the degree of saturation, which is the absence of a double bond. If we have a chain of 18 carbons and there's no double bond, we um, depict it like this, no double bonds, 18 carbons. 18-1 is a monounsaturated fatty acid that has one double bond, some have two, some have three, some have four, and so it goes on. And the position of these double bonds um, is also relevant, and that's where we you may have come across the terms omega-3 fatty acids or omega-6 fatty acids, and that's down to the position of the double bonds. This little diagram here shows three different fatty acids, all with 16 carbons. The one at the top has two double bonds, and if we come in from this end, the, um, the first double bond is, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, so that's an omega-6. An omega-3 fatty acid has the first double bond, three carbons in. And the balance of these different fatty acids is what um, influences the, um, their contribution to our diet. Are they going to be a, a metabolic threat, maybe from saturated fats, or are they beneficial? Do they have a, an important metabolic role that we need to think about. Generally speaking, the unsaturated fats are good. They have a number of positive effects on our health, but the balance between omega-3 and omega-6 is important. I don't want to dwell too long on this, but my concern is that the advice, the dietary advice to reduce our total fat intake is going to reduce our intake of all fatty acids and we don't eat enough or consume enough omega-3 fatty acids, this N3. Our diets generally in the Western world are deficient in omega-3. So if we cut fat per se, we're going to reduce that even further. It's, I advocate it's better to change the composition of the fat rather than reduce the amount. So reduce the saturated fat and possibly omega-6 and increase omega-3 fatty acids. Western diets has um, a deficiency of omega-3 but excess omega-6 and that can have a negative impact on omega-3 metabolism. Ideally we want two to four of six to one of omega-3 and that's our total diet, that's the target. And High intakes of vegetable oil, things like soya oil or sunflower oil, um, will exacerbate a shortage of, of omega-3 in our diet. And hopefully, don't get daunted by this um, biochemistry, but this explains why. This is the metabolic pathway for omega-3 fats on this side, on the left-hand side, and omega-6 fats on the right-hand side. Um, and they share an enzyme system. The 18 carbon omega-3 fat, fatty acid can get converted to the long chain omega-3s that we're supposed to get from fish oil. Um, but if we have too much omega-6 in our metabolism, this, these enzymes and this metabolic pathway is pushed in this direction and this bit doesn't happen. Generally speaking, Forages are high in omega-3, 
and seeds and grains are high in omega-6. And I'll say a bit about that later when she talks about her results. So the health risk from excess omega-6 is not particularly well recognized, um, but it can block the synthesis of these, oops, sorry, <laughs> these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, which is why they tend to be considered essential. In theory, we should be able to make these ourselves, but in practice, because of excess omega-6, uh, we, we can't. But a very low proportion of the population actually eat oily fish um, and the intake doesn't supply enough of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And I want to show in our results that lean grass fed beef and lamb can, can help in this respect. And um, the milk will help the balance between omega-3 and omega-6. The other fatty acid I want to briefly mention is conjugated linoleic acid, which is only available in from ruminant milk and meat. Um, and it has a number of, of metabolic roles in our, our body. Just before I hand over to Hannah, I'll say a bit about what happens in the, the ruminant with fat metabolism. We all, hopefully, we all know they've evolved on forage feeds, not particularly high in fat or lipids, um, but mostly omega-3 rather than grains and seeds that are high in omega-6. Unfortunately, the rumen bugs do a great job at digesting the cellulose, but they also saturate or hydrogenate all of the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So that's why we have high levels of, of saturated fat in, um, in the ruminant products. And that will depend on how long the food stays, the feed stays in the rumen, which will depend on how the level of nutrition, if it's a finely ground concentrate or, or um, straw, grass and clover. And again, I think Hannah says, we'll see a bit about that. As if that isn't complicated enough, it's further complicated because within the adipose tissue, the fat tissue and the udder of the, the, the animals, they um, have subsequent elongation and desaturation. This is an evolutionary process that the cows won't produce saturated fat, which tends to be solid at, at body temperature um, in order to come out in the milk, they, they put more double bonds in. So the point I want to make is that the fatty acid profiles in milk and meat are unpredictable. It depends on what they're eating, how long it stays in the rumen, and what goes on in the udder or the, um, or the mammary gland, sorry, or the adipose tissue. Okay, Hannah will talk about the, um, her findings in, in, with milk composition. I need to stop sharing. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gillian. Um, okay, hopefully you can now all see um, my screen. Um, so thank you, Gillian, for that um, good, very thorough overview of fatty acids. Um, I'm gonna, I'll start with introductions. So yeah, I'm Hannah. I'm I uh, work with Gillian at Newcastle University and uh, Gillian supervised me through my PhD where I worked on the SUSCAP project um, and now I lecture in sort of sustainable livestock production systems um, and product quality. Um, and my research really centres around um, milk quality and how we can manage ruminants in a way that is good for human health and good for the environment and good for the ruminants. So. Um, I thought I'd start by what it is that we mean by milk quality um, and feel free to correct me and uh, stick something in the chat if you don't agree um, or you want to add anything here. Um, but typically to farmers, um, milk quality is, or to farmers and the dairy industry, milk quality is more than 4% butterfat, more than 3.3% protein, um, a low somatic cell count and a low back to scan. Um, whereas to consumers, it often means something different. 
Um, consumers are often looking for low fat and antibiotic free, you know, long shelf life. Um, and more and more commonly, they're also looking for the impact that ruminant production or um, agriculture has on animal welfare and the environmental impact. Um, and to researchers, all of those things are important. Um, but as Gillian has explained, we're also interested in this fatty acid profile and the overall sort of effect on health. So that's looking at yeah, the fatty acid profile and the micro and macronutrients. Um, so these, as Gillian mentioned, are the um, two fatty acids. So when we take the milk samples, we extract the lipid and then we put them through gas chromatography. So as you can see here in each of, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse moving, but if you can, um, each of these two peaks, this is ALA, so that's alpha linolenic acid, acid, sorry, which is the predominant omega-3 fatty acid. And this is CLA-9, which is the predominant conjugated linoleic acid, which Gillian mentioned. So these are fatty acids that we really want to increase in the human diet. Um, mostly ALA it is essential. Um, and CLA-9, as Gillian mentioned, we only get from ruminants. Um, they've both been linked to various immune responses, um, lowering the risk of coronary heart disease um, and good, especially omega-3, um, good for brain development and supports healthy aging. Um, so as you can see really clearly here, been through the gas chromatography and then we sort of draw a line under the bottom of each of the peaks and this area under the curve um, allows us to calculate how much the relative proportion of each of these fatty acids is. Oh. Um, so as you can see really clearly here, this study, we looked at the difference between um, PFLA milk, organic milk from the supermarket and conventional milk. Um, and there was a really much more of both ALA and CLA-9 in the partial fed milk from the organic and the organic from the conventional. Um, so then we went on to look at um, fatty acid content of milk from these different dairy systems. So we kept the samples from um, the supermarket, organic and not organic. And then we also looked at 100% grazing, so PFLA, um, 90% and 85%. So this is the proportion of forage in the dairy diet. Um, so here we have these in the bottom left, these um, long chain omega-3 fatty acids. So that's EPA, DPA and DHA. And as Gillian mentioned, they are the ones that we really want to try and get from our diet because we don't get enough omega-3, so it's hard for us to metabolize um, these fatty acids. And as you can see, the 100% grazing and the supermarket organic had the highest proportion of these, these um, long-chain fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids. And then when we look at the omega-3, or total, not total omega-3, the alpha-linolenic acid, the highest proportion was in the 100% grazing um, and the lowest proportion of the omega-6 fatty acid was also from the 100% grazing. Um, so what I found from my research and really how Gillian described it as well, the important thing that people and researchers and nutritionists are sort of catching on to more and more is this ratio and this ratio that exists in the diet and the difficulties with metabolism if that ratio is out of balance. Um, so the lower we can get this ratio, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to metabolize um, these omega-3 fatty acids. So as you can see here, having uh, LA, so that's omega-6, to ALA, omega-3, that if you can have that ratio below one, that's going to probably impact the overall ratio in the diet. Whereas here we have in the conventional um, or the supermarket non-organic milk, um, we have a ratio up at nearly four. And as Julian mentioned, the sort of what we're aiming for in the human diet is sort of four to six to one. Um, so this is not going to help reduce that ratio in the human diet. Um, so this um, is slightly confusing, I understand, but I will hopefully explain you through it. Um, so we, using a large data set that was collected in 2011 and 2012, we explored um, if there's a relationship between breed and fatty acids. 
Um, so this data set collected milk from many of the same cows in autumn, winter, spring, and summer 2011 into 2012 um, from a range of different farms with a range of different um, production intensities and a range of different, um, yeah, so conventional organic going from predominantly forage to predominantly concentrate. Um, so here we have averaged all of those results. So statistically, it's not the best, but it helps to give us an idea of what it could look like. Um, so we've got the number of cows, these numbers here, and the number of farms in brackets, and each of these breeds. Um, I've realized I have not given you a table that explains which each of those breeds are, um, but hopefully you're familiar with most. So the BF, that's British Frisian, and um, that's crossed with a Jersey. Um, here the Holstein Frisian um, is HF and NZF is New Zealand Frisian. Um, SR, Scandinavian Reds and SH is Shorthorn, Ayrshire and uh, Montbelliard. Um, if it's one breed right next to another breed, that means it's the first generation cross. So it's a purebred, for example, Holstein Frisian bred with a purebred Jersey. Whereas if it's an X, that means it's a back cross. So that means three breeds would have gone into, um, the, the predominant breed will be Holstein Frisian and then there will be two other breeds. Um, so here we have the proportion um, of the milk fatty acid profile that was saturated fatty acids in green, um, monounsaturated fatty acids in blue, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, so that's the omega-6 and the omega-3, in yellow. Um, so all that is to say is that this graph doesn't really show you much, but has allowed me to explain what it means before we move on to the next slide. So I've taken the polyunsaturated fatty acids um, from that previous um, chart and looked at the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So what we've, I've ordered this, put this in order of um, highest ratio down to lowest ratio. Um, and as you can see, the standard deviation, so the variation within these samples is fairly large. And that's because, as I said, this has been averaged over the full year. So it's four samples from each cow over the full year. Um, so that's taking into consideration the seasonal variation, the variation um, by a stage of lactation and by diet. Um, so that does give us a fairly good idea um, that some of these differences could be down to the genetics. Um, so one thing to pull out here or a couple of things that I thought was fairly interesting is the lowest ratio was both of these British Frisian um, breeds. And I had a look and these were not, oh, I know it's only three farms, but of these three farms, they weren't all the same management. Um, so there is probably something else going on here. Um, I also thought it was interesting that a lot of the Holstein Frisians and Holstein Frisian crosses were up here. Um, but the highest ratio, yeah, is the shorthorn. And actually we found throughout the study that the shorthorn in terms of how we were defining and looking at production and efficiency, um, the shorthorn pretty much consistently performed, the worst is maybe a strong way to put it, but they had the highest ratio and um, they had a lot of health treatments um, and the lowest yield. And I'll talk about that more in the webinar in a few weeks time. Um, so, of that omega-6 and omega-3, so it's all well and good looking at the ratio, we know we want to reduce that ratio, um, but as Gillian said, it's not that we're trying to reduce the polyunsaturated fatty acid content. If anything, we want to increase the polyunsaturated fatty acid content and decrease the amount of saturated fat. And that's easier to do in diet than um, within the milk. So, what we see here, so this is ordered by, again, omega-6, the highest omega-6 is over here on the left. So what we see here is actually the shorthorn has given us the most polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I think that is something important to note when we're thinking about how this breed performs within these systems. Um, and that's something, again, that we can bring up in the next webinar. Um, again, lowest proportion of um, polyunsaturated fatty acids in the milk. Um, we've got Holstein Frisian, New Zealand Frisian cross here. Um, but really, the highest proportion of the omega-3 fatty acids 
tend to be um, the Ayrshire, which we found in the study, and um, one of the New Zealands. I can't remember which was one of this, um, but I can follow it up. Um, what was next? Um, oh, so looking at yield, um, I pulled out the fat solids and the protein solids. Um, I know for a lot of you, again, feel free to correct me, yield is not your primary goal for production, um, but I still think it's something that's important to look at and it's something that will affect um, farmers on the whole. Um, so I think when it came down to the production, the highest solids were from the New Zealand Frisian. So the highest liquid milk yield was the New Zealand Frisian and the highest solids um, and that's, as you can see, it's the New Zealand Frisians crossed and the Jersey crosses producing the highest um, solids followed by the Ayrshire. And again, we've got this British Frisian cross down the end here. Um, so that's the breed that had the lowest omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, also had um, the lowest um, total solids. So again, it's something to think about. So that brings me on to sort of why does that matter and what's, what's the impact? What can farmers do or what can, what do cows eat really? Um, so this data I pulled from this paper down the bottom here by Glasser et al in 2013. Um, and I have ordered it again by ALA, so the main omega-3 fatty acid. So now we're not looking at the milk, we're looking at what cows eat in terms of forage. Um, and what Glasser et al. found was the ALA, so as Julian mentioned, like from forage, about 4% of that is the fat. And of that, that's broken down predominantly into ALA, LA, and palmitic acid. And palmitic acid is C16, and that is a saturated fatty acid. Um, and then the other fats are mostly these polyunsaturated fats, ALA and LA. So found, they found typically that it was ryegrass that had the highest proportion of alpha linolenic acid um, and really the lowest proportion of sort of any <laughs> fatty acids is this poor quality hay. And it probably will not surprise you to learn that the cows that ate the cereal lipids, so see here the cereal lipids have the highest proportion of LA, like barely any ALA at all. Um, and as we saw, in the milk earlier on, the highest proportion of LA in the milk came from the cows that we assume had eaten um, the most cereals. So that's the conventional store-bought milk. So really what we found sort of time and time again now is the more forage that you can put into the cow, the more omega-3 will be in the milk. And that's really supported here as we see, the more omega-3 that they can eat, uh, the more we assume, or we hope, goes into the milk. So again, what does that mean for, for farming? What does that mean for grazing management? And how can we optimize it with this grazing management? So we know what the main factors are that influence um, the fat and the fatty acid um, content of, sorry, lost my train of thought, um, of the foragers and species. So that's the vegetation stage, the conditions of um, conservation or at conservation and fertilization. Um, so something that I was really thinking about when um, I was comparing some of these milk samples was the difference in mineral end use between sort of the low input systems compared to organic and or PFLA. So in low input systems, it's much more likely that they would use mineral N instead of the um, red and white clover that is often used in the, um, or other legumes used in organic and PFLA milk. Um, so I have seen some conflicted evidence on this as well. So don't take this as 100%, but the thought is, is that clover is more digestible than grass. So that means that as Julian was saying earlier, it moves through the rumen a little bit faster, which means that it's not being biohydrogenated which means that it's, there's more ALA and potentially LA that leaves the rumen before biohydrogenation. And that might mean that it arrives at the mammary gland still intact. Um, but really more research is needed to sort of understand the impact that the forage fatty acid profiles have on the milk fatty acid profiles. 
And the other thing that I've been thinking about and researching um, and reading about too is um, the grazing management strategy. So if you're employing a continuous or a set, set stocking management strategy, so the cows are going out into one field and staying in that field or one or two fields for the entire grazing season, there's not necessarily a constant supply of fresh leafy forage. Again, depending on your management and how you manage to work that out, some farmers might. Sorry if I've just offended you, but hope, but you get my gist. It's they tend to not let the grass recover or the sward recover, um, which means, and because it's predominantly just uh, rye grass, it means that towards the end of the grazing season, um, that fresh leafy forage is in very short supply and has probably turned a bit stemmy and less palatable. Whereas farmers that tend to use paddock or mob grazing, they typically um, sow a much more diverse sward. And that diverse sward means that there is more variation in when the um, grasses and when the sward gets leafy, um, which means that there's more dry matter and more leafy green dry matter available later on into the grazing season. Um, so what I was thinking about here is that in one of our earlier studies that I linked to, is that we found very little seasonal variation from the PFLA milk samples that we took a few years ago, whereas in both the organic and the conventional milk samples, there was a great deal of seasonal variation um, in the omega-6, uh, but mostly the omega-3 content. Um, so this grazing strategy, which tends to be employed by more of the PFLA and um, some organic farmers, might throughout the season have a positive effect on the milk fatty acid profile too. Um, okay, so I think I have probably rambled on for long <laughs> enough. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I'm excited to uh, hopefully answer some of your questions. But I will pass you back to Gillian. Okay, um, back to my screen if I can get it up. Right, I'm conscious time is getting on, so uh, I, we've, uh, <laughs> I'll just briefly give you a reminder of what we did on the meat side, where we're looking at the fat composition of, of beef. We bought, so, going too quickly now, we bought sirloin steaks in the supermarket um, two years ago. We had conventional organic PFLA and we had some conservation grazing steaks. I should put a warning in at this point in time that the conservation steaks, some of those came from freezers. They weren't winter finished. You know, they, they weren't um, a, at a comparable time of year. So the, it's interesting to look at them, but strictly speaking, not on the same level as the, um, the, the meat we bought in May and June. The results I'm going to show you are just a snapshot of different ratios and um, different fatty acids. The first chart here is looking at two ratios. One is the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which is the blue bars. And we can see from the farming systems along the bottom here, we have this drop in, in the ratio of six to three, going from the non-organic to the organic down to the pasture fed and conservation was, was similar. The other ratio I'm showing here is in the blue, the green um, squares is the saturated fatty acid to polyunsaturated fatty acid. Bear in mind, we want to reduce saturated fatty acid and increase polyunsaturated fatty acid. So for both of these ratios, we want low values. And you can see the beef we bought from the pasture fed farms were low in both both of these ratios and um, the conservation stake was even lower in, in saturated fat. The other set of results I want to show is looking at the, the omega-3 fatty acids. So these are the long chain, the, the orange, gray and yellow blocks are these long chain omega-3 fats that we're supposed to get from oily fish, at least that's the recommendations. And again, we can see total omega-3 fats increasing as we go away from intensive to, to less, to more extensive systems. And I'll just um, 
comment on the conservation stakes. Some came from supermarkets, probably some are finished. And we can see this error bar here is that represents the variation. So these were far more variable because some of them would have been finished with cattle in the, the summer months rather than over the winter, at the end of the winter. So we, but the exciting thing about these results is that if we look at the long chain omega-3 fats, these, these three um, long chain omega-3 fats, the pasture fed and the conservation steaks actually qualify as a source of long chain omega-3 fats. They have more than um, 40 milligrams of these long chain fats for every 100 grams. So that's the exciting thing with this research. Um, we have published these results, but um, if I get, this is a, a link to the paper if you want the academic paper, or there's a consumer version or a, a, um, a farmer version of our technical notes is it maybe a bit more um, accessible um, if you don't want to, to look at the academic paper? Um, and I, I um, wonder if they are more sustainable than oily fish um, as a source of these long chain omega-3. The levels, although they are a source of omega-3, they are still very much lower than the oily fish um, in terms of the level. But hopefully our research has shown that there is scope to, to um, really enhance meat quality. Oh, my screen has stopped moving. <laughs> so that was a, a potted version of our beef paper. We can explore that later in questions if, if we end up having time. We also looked at the consumer awareness of the benefit from grass fed over mainstream milk and meat. And this had two parts to it. Both were fairly superficial compared to some of the work that the, the PFLA have done themselves. One was a, a student online poll to judge um, consumers' attitude. Um, and, and Vicky had about 140 replies 25% were aware of the PFLA and 19% claimed to have bought certified meat. Just over a quarter were aware of the potential health benefits, but you could think, well, three quarters were not aware of the difference that pasture fed would make to, um, to, to consumer health. And after reading about the health benefits, 60% stated that they would probably buy grass-fed and just less than half were willing to pay a premium. But the reasons for not buying were dominated by sourcing or too expensive. Um, and I think possibly there's an education aspect to, to this. Second part of our consumer study was looking at academic papers. Um, and there's quite a lot out there. This is a, an interesting paper on what is it? A, a systematic review of my mouse, a systematic review of, of consumer attitude for, for beef quality. Before I look at this in more detail, just a couple of warning messages. Attitudes to grass to on any food purchase is very complex. It does vary between countries and societies, but it also changes. Um, and often these studies are a snapshot in time and something 10 years ago might not be as relevant today as, as a, a more recent study. And the other warning, although many of them talk about grass fed or free range or pasture access, they don't explore what the consumers at um, think about these terms, um, and I doubt if any of them are 100% forage diets. That said, um, that that um, review paper that I had on that previous slide looked at 12, the top 12 um, attitudes or quality attributes that people feel are important in buying their beef. And all except 
three, no, yes, three that I've got there could apply to um, pasture fed. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, it's quite encouraging that um, that the things that are important are on offer from the pasture fed um, group of meat. So I very tentatively stuck my neck out and said that certainly the messages that we give consumers and to try and sell our products and, and um, enhance sustainability of, of meat production, they need to be simple, yet they're complicated systems. And I think we need to inform the consumers about the benefits of grass fed over mainstream production. Um, not just to the nutritional work that we're talking about, but environmental and, and animal welfare as well. Maybe think about true cost of production, including what it costs society to put everything right. And, and again, exploring this less but better principles. Um, and our products need to be accessible and visible with clear um, certification labeling um, that will give the consumers confidence that what they're buying is what they, they think they're getting. Conscious, we've rattled on with an awful lot of results. Um, it's over to you now and, and we can have a discussion about what you, you think of our results and, and what might be, be relevant. Nikki, I think you must be on mute. Oh, could you just end your screen share so that we oh, can sorry. see? Oh, yeah. um, So that everyone can oh, see. Oh, my mouse is working. <laughs> Perfect. And just that means that the uh, participants can see you and Hannah. Um, so we've had a few questions. I know that you've answered a few already um, by uh, typing them in, Gillian, but we might just go back through those because not everybody might be able to see them. So um, very quick, short question. Um, Hannah, when you were looking at the breeds, were the short horns pasture fed or grain fed? Both. Um, I just saw that question and checked my Excel spreadsheet. Um, there's, it was all through the year. So um, I know you all feed pasture just throughout the year, but most of them were conventional or organic and uh, it was a complete range of feeding intensities. Brilliant, okay. Um, right, we've got loads of questions now coming in. They're flying <laughs> in. So I'm just gonna go through them in order. Um, so there's a question from Derek. Uh, Gillian, this might be one for you. Why do you want to reduce saturated fat? The supposed evidence of a link between saturated fat and heart disease is flimsy, principally weak, um, epileological studies this will teach me for being on a webinar where i can't pronounce half a word <laughs> um yeah i'll leave it at that there's some other information there that he talks about um some research that's been undertaken so could you just give us a very quick yeah. overview of why we want to reduce saturated fats yes saturated fat isn't as bad as we thought it was 20 years ago but individual fatty acids have shown um to be to cause a threat especially C14, to some extent C16, palmitic, C12, but they're not all as harmful as each other. And I think we need to start looking at individual fatty acids rather than lumping them all together and saying they're all bad. Because as he says, some saturated fatty acids are, are neutral or have a positive effect. Yeah, the overwhelming sort of health advice both from the NHS uh, and from a lot of the research is that the general population in the UK consumes way too much saturated fat. So it's not, um, we're not saying, they're not saying that every single person needs to reduce the saturated fat, but as Gillian said, there's so much, so much nuance in there um, with regards to which saturated fatty acids um, are linked to which health risks. Okay. Um, we'll move on. We've got some more questions. So um, can we legally claim under the European Nutrition and Health Claim Regulations that pasture fed slash conservation beef is higher in omega-3, i.e. at least 30% higher? Um, you can claim it's higher, but the, the, um, the legal claim is, is a source of omega-3, but it has, has, does have a caveat because the, they, go, they ignore 
the DPE, which is the middle fatty acid, which is an inter a metabolic intermediate between EPA and DHA, and yet they don't count it. And beef tends to be higher in DPA than, than fish. Fish is not particularly high in DPA, and it has largely been ignored in a lot of metabolic studies until relatively recently. And they're I think they're trying to catch up with, um, you know, its relevance. I put them all, all three together and they were over the threshold for a legal claim that it is a source of, fat, of omega-3, but not according to the EU definition. Hannah, do you want to say anything on that? I don't think I have anything to add. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so leading on to that, uh, Liz Greenhalgh has asked about the implications for food labelling. Now, she asked about butter, milk and cheese. And there was a previous question that asked about is the level of fat preserved in processed products? And Gillian, you said um, it's more or less the same as in the original yeah. milk. So um, in that instance, what is the implication for food labelling? I, I don't know if you want to say, come in, Hannah, on that. You can go first and I'll follow up. No, I mean, the, the labelling is um, there are definitions for low fat or different things and, and there isn't one that it's higher than mainstream. So it either needs to go over the threshold to be classed as a source of omega-3. Um, I looked at organic milk and butter before and it because it's milk is not particularly high in fat, um, four or 5% fat, it doesn't qualify as a source of omega-3 fats because you've got all the water there and it's diluting it. With butter, it probably could because you've got higher fat level because it's so much per 100 grams of the, the food. So, um, but um, if you've got a low fat level anyway, it's difficult to get over that threshold. Yeah. I would agree. And I think we just haven't done enough research on the um, grass, especially the 100% forage for uh, forage. Sorry, I meant cheese. Um, there hasn't been enough research into the cheese and the butter, um, especially on the 100% forage fed side of things for us to really say how that affects the full fatty acid profile. So I suppose, and that links to some of the other questions that are coming through about um, I think Dan Stevenson said, Dan Stevenson has said, this is great information. How do we get this out to the consumer, particularly when all animal products often consider the same in the wider plant versus animal debate? And actually it's about supporting farms who are following 100% um, pasture fed to get certified, be able to then use that certification. And then the job of the PFLA to, to highlight the benefits of that. So mm. um, maybe rather than currently relying on food labeling to do that for us, that having the certification and then broadening the public awareness of that is going to be the, 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 the approach that probably we need to take. Okay, um, I'm really conscious of time, so I'm gonna fly through some of these questions. Um, there's a question about uh, higher milk fat. So do higher, does higher milk fat have higher omega-3? For example, Holstein 3.7 versus Jersey butter fat of five. So is there a link there? Now, all our results are relative to the total fats. So whether it's 3% fat or 5% fat, the proportion of each fatty acid will be the same. And we only look at the, a proportion of the total fat, not with the other ingredients, uh, constituents. Another great question that links back to your comments, Gillian, about fish. How does omega-3 content in pasture-fed beef compare to salmon per 100 grams? This is a very <laughs> specific question from Philippa. Um, I saw that and I haven't got time to go and look it up. It's, it's much, much lower. And it's interesting that farmed salmon is lower than wild salmon per, um, as a proportion of the, the total fats because we give them other um, not natural diets, but the farmed salmon does tend to have higher fat content. So um, I'm not saying pasture fed beef is higher than salmon, it's very much lower but it's 
um, potentially more widely used within consumers' diets or easier access. Okay, thanks, Jillian. And um, we've just got three minutes left. So um, a question from, from Angus Dalton, who says, so can I make the claim with confidence that my butter is a source of omega-3? I'm going to assume that it's, it's pasture-fed or pasture-for-life certified. Um, would Angus be able to make that claim? You can confidently say that it has omega-3. <laughs> <laughs> I would, if he wants to make a claim, I would say he would need to get it analysed. And the threshold is 40 grams of long-chain omega-3 per 100 grams of butter. So we'd need Excellent. to work that out. So that comes to Martin Gibson's question, which is, can a normal farm or any farm get their meat or I guess milk or butter tested for fatty acid content at a reasonable price? Um, commercial labs do charge quite a bit, probably about £100 per sample. Um, just a ballpark figure, maybe some of the people, the participants would, would know the actual amount, but when I looked into it a couple of years ago, that was the sort of ballpark figure. Um, yeah, the best for that sorry. you get the whole range. <laughs> I was gonna say the best thing you can do is keep your eye on sort of Twitter um, and the likes, and hope that a research project comes up and then jump <laughs> on board. I know a lot of the PFLA farmers um, that took part part in the dairy study, so they've got their results of, well, at least from 2018, what their milk fatty acids look like. Mm. I, I would say that um, the PFLA are looking for uh, opportunities to work with researchers and to develop um, a project to uh, help certified farms and also engage with member, member farms to get some of those tests done at um, with a yeah, kind of subsidized rate. So do, if you're a member, um, keep an eye on on updates because we will potentially be looking for farms to work with on that in the in the coming year or so. Um, we've just got one minute left. I'm trying to choose a question <laughs> out of all of the many many questions that are here. Um, there's a question on um, what effect does the feed and different kinds of pasture sward have on protein content? Um, but I think from a previous question, Hannah, you were you've said that you're not looking at protein. You've been looking specifically at the fats. Is that right? I've been looking specifically at the fats. Yeah. But we know that sort of as the grazing season goes on, on as the green sort of leaves, leaves the plant, the protein goes down. So, And we also know that protein, milk protein is governed more by the genetics of the cow, whereas the fat. It's genetics are important, but it's dominated by the, the diet that they're getting. So it's down to what breed rather than what feed. Excellent. Well, we're at six o'clock. Um, we probably should have scheduled in a couple of hours for this with all the questions that were coming in and the opportunity for discussion and debate. Um, I would just like to highlight that we have um, a another webinar in this series um, highlighting the work of the SUSCAP project, which will be on the um, 3rd of June at five o'clock. Um, so we will be sending out registration details um, as we have for this one to supporters, members and via um, social media. So please keep an eye on that. Um, and that will be with Hannah again and colleagues from um, other universities in the project. So Harvard Steinshem and Carsten Malish who will also be um, joining Hannah for that discussion. Thank you so much, Hannah and Gillian for your time this evening. Um, we will be, we've recorded this webinar, so we will be sending that out, making that available on YouTube. Um, and I think that there's obviously lots of questions that are come in. So it might be Hannah and Gillian that we need you to do a bit of a blog or something to answer some of those that we could share with members. But thanks again so much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having such an interested audience. Yeah. Indeed, and so many people. So thanks everybody <laughs> yeah. and have a, have a lovely rest of your evening. Take thanks care. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.